I walk toward the iron gate of my old prison, toward Bela waiting for me on the grass. Out of the corner of my eye, I see a man in uniform pacing back and forth under the sign. He is a museum guard, not a soldier. But it is impossible, when I see him marching in his uniform, not to freeze, not to hold my breath, not to expect the shout of a gun, the blast of bullets. For a split second I am a terrified girl again, a girl who is in danger. I am the imprisoned me. But I breathe, I wait for the moment to pass. I feel for the blue American passport in my coat pocket. The guard reaches the wrought iron sign and turns around, marching back into the prison. He must stay here. It is his duty to stay. But I can leave. I am free. I leave Auschwitz. I skip out. I pass under the words, Arbeit mocked free. How cruel and mocking those words were when we realized that nothing we could do would set us free. But as I leave the barracks and the ruined crematories and the watch houses and the visitors and the museum guard behind me, as I skip under the dark iron letters toward my husband, I see the words spark with truth. Work has set me free. I survived so that I could do my work. Not the work the Nazis meant, the hard labor of sacrifice and hunger, of exhaustion and enslavement. It was the inner work. Of learning to survive and thrive, of learning to forgive myself, of helping others to do the same. And when I do this work, then I am no longer the hostage or the prisoner of anything. I am free. Part 4 Healing Chapter 20 The Dance of Freedom One of the last times I saw Viktor Frankl was at the Third World Congress on Logotherapy, in Regensburg in 1983. He was almost 80, I was 56. In many ways I was the same person who had fallen into a panic in an El Paso lecture hall when I put a little paperback book into my bag. I still spoke English with a thick accent. I still had flashbacks. I still carried painful images and mourned the losses of the past. But I no longer felt like I was the victim of anything. I felt, and will always feel, tremendous love and gratitude for my two liberators, the G.I. who pulled me from a heap of bodies at Gunskirchen, and Viktor Frankl who gave me permission not to hide anymore, who helped me find words for my experience, who helped me to cope with my pain. Through his mentorship and friendship, I discovered a purpose in my suffering, a sense of meaning that helped me not only to come to peace with the past but also to emerge from my trials with something precious worth sharing, a path to freedom. The last night of the conference, we danced. There we were, two aging dancers. Two people enjoying the sacred present. Two survivors who had learned to thrive and be free. My decades-long friendship with Viktor Frankl, and my healing relationships with all of my patients, including those I have even been describing, have taught me the same important lesson that I began studying at Auschwitz. Our painful experiences aren't a liability, they're a gift. They give us perspective and meaning, an opportunity to find our unique purpose and our strength. There is no one-size-fits-all template for healing, but there are steps that can be learned and practiced, steps that each individual can weave together in his or her own way, steps in the dance of freedom. My first step in the dance was to take responsibility for my feelings. To stop repressing and avoiding them and to stop blaming them on Bela or other people, to accept them as my own. This was a vital step in Captain Jason Fuller's healing too. Like me, he was in the habit of cutting his feelings off, of running from them until they got big enough to control him, instead of the other way around. I told him that he couldn't avoid pain by avoiding his feelings. 
He had to take responsibility for experiencing, and eventually expressing, them safely, and then for letting them go. In those early weeks of treatment, I taught him a mantra for managing his emotions, notice, accept, check, stay. When a feeling started to overwhelm him, the first action toward managing the feeling was to notice, to acknowledge, that he was having a feeling. He could say to himself, Aha! Here I go again. This is anger. This is jealousy. This is sadness. My Jungian therapist taught me something that I find quite comforting, that although it feels like the palette of human feelings is limitless, in fact every emotional shade, like every color, is derived from just a few primary emotions, sad, mad, glad, scared. For those just learning an emotional vocabulary, as I was, it's less overwhelming to learn to identify only four feelings. Once he could name his feelings, Jason needed to accept that those feelings were his own. They might be triggered by someone else's actions or speech, but they were his. Lashing out at someone else wasn't going to make them go away. Then, once he was there with the feeling, he was to check his body response. Am I hot? Cold? Is my heart racing? How's my breathing? Am I okay? Tuning into the feeling itself, and to how it was moving in his body, would help him stay with it until it passed or changed. He didn't have to cover, medicate, or run from his feelings. He could choose to feel them. They were only feelings. He could accept them, bear them, stay with them, because they were temporary. Once Jason was more adept at tuning into his feelings, we practiced how to respond to them, instead of reacting. Jason had learned to live like he was in a pressure cooker. He kept himself under tight control, until he burst. I helped him learn to be more like a teapot, to vent off the steam. Sometimes he'd come to a session and I'd ask him how he was feeling, and he said, I feel like screaming. And I said, okay. Let's scream. Let's get it all out so it doesn't make you ill. As Jason learned to accept and face his feelings, he also began to see that in many ways he was recreating the fear, repression, and violence of his childhood in his current family. The need to control his feelings, learned at the hand of an abusive father, had translated into a need to control his wife and his children. Sometimes our healing helps us to repair our relationships with our partners. Sometimes our healing releases the other person to do his or her own growth. After a few months of joining him for couples counseling, Jason's wife told him that she was ready to separate. Jason was shocked and furious. I was concerned that his grief over the failed marriage would govern how he treated his children. At first Jason was vindictive and wanted to fight for full custody, but he was able to shift his all-or-nothing mindset, and he and his wife worked out an agreement to share custody. He was able to mend and nurture his relationships with the people who had inspired him to drop the gun, his kids. He ended the legacy of violence. Once we are recognizing and taking responsibility for our feelings, we can learn to recognize and take responsibility for our role in the dynamic that shapes our relationships. As I learned in my marriage and in my relationships with my children, one of the proving grounds for our freedom is in how we relate to our loved ones. This is something that comes up frequently in my work. June wore pressed slacks and a button-up shirt the morning I met him. Ling stepped through the door in a perfectly tailored skirt and blazer, her makeup expertly applied and her hair carefully coiffed. June sat at one end of the couch, his eyes going over the framed diplomas and photographs on my office walls, looking everywhere except at Ling. 
She perched neatly on the edge of the couch and looked right at me. This is the problem, she said without preamble. My husband drinks too much. June's face reddened. He seemed on the verge of speaking, but he kept quiet. It has to stop, Ling said. I asked what it was. What were the behaviors she found so objectionable? According to Ling, over the last year or two, June's drinking had gone from an occasional evening or weekend activity to an everyday ritual. He began before he came home, with a scotch at a bar near the university campus where he was a professor. That drink was followed at home by another, and another. By the time they sat down for dinner with their two children, his eyes were a little glassy, his voice a little too loud, his jokes a little too off-color. Ling felt lonely and burdened by the responsibility of marching the kids through clean-up and bedtime routines. By the time she was ready for sleep, she was simmering with frustration. When I asked about their intimate life, Ling blushed, and then told me that June used to initiate sex when they went to bed, but often she was too upset to reciprocate. Now he usually fell asleep on the couch. That's not all, she said. She was listing all the evidence. He breaks dishes because he's drunk. He comes home late. He forgets things that I tell him. He's driving drunk. He's going to get in an accident. How can I trust him to drive the kids? As Ling spoke, June seemed to disappear. His eyes dropped to his lap. He looked hurt, reserved, ashamed, and angry, but his hostility was directed inward. I asked June for his perspective on their daily life. I'm always responsible with the kids, he said. She has no right to accuse me of putting them in danger. What about your relationship with Ling? How do you see your marriage working? He shrugged. I'm here he said. I notice a big space between you on the couch. Is that an accurate indication of a big gulf between you? Ling gripped her purse. It's accurate, June said. It's because he drinks. Ling interjected. That's what's making this distance. It sounds like there's a lot of anger there pushing you apart. Ling looked quickly at her husband before nodding. I see a lot of couples locked in the same dance. She nags, he drinks. He drinks, she nags. That's the choreography they've chosen. But what if one of them changes the steps? I wonder, I began. I wonder if your marriage would survive if June stopped drinking. June's jaw clenched. Ling loosened her hold on her purse. Exactly, she said. This is what needs to happen. What would really happen if June stopped drinking? I asked. I told them about another couple I know. The husband was also a drinker. One day, he'd had enough. He didn't want to drink anymore. He wanted to get help. He decided that rehab was the best option, and he started working hard on his sobriety. This was precisely what his wife had been praying would happen. They both expected his sobriety to be the solution to all their problems. But as his recovery progressed, their marriage got worse. When the wife visited the rehab facility, angry and bitter feelings would surface. She couldn't stop herself from rehashing the past. Remember five years ago when you came home and threw up all over my favorite rug? And that other time you ruined our anniversary party? She couldn't keep from reciting a litany of all the mistakes he'd made, all the ways he'd hurt and disappointed her. The better her husband got, the worse she became. He felt stronger, less toxic, less ashamed 
more in touch with himself, more tuned in to his life and relationships. And she grew more and more enraged. He let go of the drinking, but she couldn't let go of the criticism and blame. I call this the seesaw. One person's up, and one person's down. Lots of marriages and relationships are built this way. Two people agree to an unspoken contract, one of them will be good and one of them will be bad. The whole system relies on one person's inadequacy. The bad partner gets a free pass to test all the limits, the good partner gets to say, look how selfless I am. Look how patient I am. Look at everything I put up with. But what happens if the bad one in the relationship gets sick of that role? What if he shows up to audition for the other part? Then the good one's place in the relationship is no longer secure. She's got to remind him how bad he is so she can keep her position. Or she might become bad, hostile, explosive, so that they can still balance the seesaw even if they switch positions. Either way, Blame is the pivot that keeps the two seats joined. In a lot of cases, someone else's actions really do contribute to our discomfort and unhappiness. I'm not suggesting that we should be okay with behavior that is hurtful or destructive. But we remain victims as long as we hold another person responsible for our own well-being. If Ling says, I can only be happy and at peace if June stops drinking, she leaves herself vulnerable to a life of sorrow and unrest. Her happiness will always be a bottle or a swig away from disaster. Likewise, if June says, the only reason I drink is because Ling is so nagging and critical, he gives up all of his freedom of choice. He isn't his own agent. He is Ling's puppet. He might get the temporary relief of a buzz as a protection against her unkindness, but he won't be free. So often when we are unhappy it is because we are taking too much responsibility or we are taking too little. Instead of being assertive and choosing clearly for ourselves, we might become aggressive, choosing for others, or passive, letting others choose for us, or passive-aggressive choosing for others by preventing them from achieving what they are choosing for themselves. It gives me no pleasure to admit that I used to be passive-aggressive with Bela. He was very punctual, it was important to him to be on time, and when I was annoyed with him, I would stall when it was time to leave the house. I would intentionally find a way to slow us down, to make us late, just to spite him. He was choosing to arrive on time, and I wouldn't let him get what he wanted. I told Ling and June that in blaming each other for their unhappiness, they were avoiding the responsibility of making their own joy. While on the surface they both seemed very assertive, Ling always on June's case, June doing what he pleased instead of what Ling asked him to do, they were both experts at avoiding an honest expression of, I want, or I am. Ling used the words, I want, I want my husband to stop drinking, but in wanting something for someone else, she escaped having to know what she wanted for herself. And June could rationalize his drinking by saying that his drinking was Ling's fault, a way to assert himself against her oppressive expectations and criticisms. But if you give up the authority of your own choices, then you are agreeing to be a victim and a prisoner. In the Haggadah, the Jewish text that tells the story of liberation from slavery in Egypt and teaches the prayers and rituals for Seder, the special Passover feast, there are four questions that the youngest member of the family traditionally gets to ask, the questions it was my privilege to ask at my childhood Seders, that I asked the last night I spent with my parents in our home. In my therapeutic practice I have my own version of the four questions, which I developed years ago with the help of several colleagues when we were sharing strategies for beginning a session with a new patient. These are the questions I asked Ling and June to answer now, in writing, 
so they could liberate themselves from their victimhood. First question. What do you want? This is a deceptively simple question. It can be much more difficult than we realize to give ourselves permission to know and listen to ourselves, to align ourselves with our desires. How often when we answer this question do we say what we want for someone else? I reminded Ling and June that they needed to answer this question for themselves. To say I want June to stop drinking or I want Ling to stop nagging was to avoid the question. Second question. Who wants it? This is our charge and our struggle, to understand our own expectations for ourselves versus trying to live up to others' expectations of us. My father became a tailor because his father wouldn't allow him to become a doctor. My father was good at his profession, he was commended and awarded for it, but he was never the one who wanted it, and he always regretted his unlived dream. It's our responsibility to act in service of our authentic selves. Sometimes this means giving up the need to please others, giving up our need for others' approval. Third question. What are you going to do about it? I believe in the power of positive thinking, but change and freedom also require positive action. Anything we practice, we become better at. If we practice anger, we'll have more anger. If we practice fear, we'll have more fear. In many cases, we actually work very hard to ensure that we go nowhere. Change is about noticing what's no longer working and stepping out of the familiar, imprisoning patterns. Fourth question. When? In Gone with the Wind, my mother's favorite book, Scarlett O'Hara, when confronted with a difficulty, says, I'll think about it tomorrow. After all, tomorrow is another day. If we are to evolve, instead of revolve, it's time to take action, now. Ling and June finished their responses to the questions, folded up their papers, handed them to me. We would look at them together the following week. As they got up to leave, June shook my hand. And then, walking out the door, I saw the reassurance I needed that they were willing to try to bridge the distance they had let damage their marriage, to get off the seesaw of blame. Ling turned back to June and gave him a hesitant smile. I couldn't see if he returned it, his back was to me, but I did see him gently pat her shoulder. When we met the following week, Ling and June discovered something they wouldn't have predicted. In response to the question, what do you want, they had each written the same thing, a happy marriage. Just speaking this desire, they were already on their way to having what they wanted. All they needed was some new tools. I asked Ling to work on changing her behavior in the moments after June got home each day. This was the time when she usually felt most angry and vulnerable and frightened. Would he be drunk? How drunk would he be? How drunk would he get? Was there any possibility of closeness between them, or would it be another evening of distance and hostility? She had learned to manage her fear by trying to exert control. She would sniff June's breath, make accusations, pull away. I taught her to greet her husband the same way whether he was sober or drunk, with kind eyes and a simple statement, I'm happy to see you. I'm glad you're home. If he was drunk, and she was hurt and disappointed, she was allowed to talk about those feelings. She could say, I can see you've been drinking, and that makes me feel sad because it's hard to feel close to you when you're drunk or that makes me feel worried about your safety. And she was allowed to make choices for herself in response to his choice to drink. She could say, I was hoping to talk to you tonight, but I can see you've been drinking. I'm going to do something else instead. I talked to June about the physiological components of addiction, 
and told him that I could help him heal whatever pain he was trying to medicate with alcohol, and that if he chose to get sober, he would need additional support in treating his addiction. I asked him to go to three AA meetings and see if he recognized himself in any of the stories he heard there. He did go to the assigned meetings, but as far as I know he never went back. In the time that I worked with him, he didn't stop drinking. When Ling and June ended their therapy, some things were better for them and some things weren't. They were better able to listen to each other without the need to be right, and they were spending more time on the other side of anger, where they could acknowledge their sadness and fear. There was more warmth between them. But a loneliness remained. And the fear that June's drinking would spiral out of control. Their story is a good reminder that it isn't over till it's over. As long as you live, there's the risk that you might suffer more. There's also the opportunity to find a way to suffer less, to choose happiness, which requires taking responsibility for yourself. Make sure you subscribe, so you won't miss the next part.